Hello everybody, it's Classic David with yet another podcast. Very happy to be here uh, and I uh, I'm here with Curtis like usually. Hello. Hi David. He's a Canadian living in Asia for a very long time, particularly in Japan. And we have been doing this podcast every two weeks where we cover everything and always bring you some new stuff. So a lot to talk to, a lot to all looking forward to. I guess we should start with the updates. So this is like the perfect time to pick for the podcast because uh, the market is just uh, at the moment going down pretty aggressively. Like uh, some of the altcoins are double digit down <laughs> wow, for yeah. the past uh, hours. So this is a really good time to, to do the podcast. So would you like to start with the, uh, with the Bitcoin? Yeah, so um, I guess, yeah, 38. It just, like you said, it just sold off in the last couple hours. Uh-huh. Um, so the bears are going to say we're going to test the lows now. We're going to go to the bottom of the channel. Um, the channel, I guess, is on the on the downside is the 32 to the 38, right? There's a line there. Uh, and then the up, okay. mm-hmm. you know, you could draw a line from the 32 low um, mm-hmm. in, in February, right? Or earlier. Okay. Uh, uh, no, February of this year. Okay, right yeah, there. that's 33. Yeah. From that mm-hmm. bottom, you could draw that maybe the either the wicks or, or the closes. Um, okay. That's the, yeah. So, and then, yeah, I guess that's not how I draw, but I, it's okay. Um, if you ju- if you just want the line, not the area, then yeah, just the line. Simple so line. It's it, right and if you look at the twentieth of February, or well, I'll give you January, yellow, that low that, yeah, um, and line. then so we've had reasonably higher lows, right? 32, 35, 36. Um, <laughs> yeah, continue. <laughs> and then um, so that's sort of what we're looking for at the bottom. Um, but it's been trending up somewhat, like we've had higher lows, right? Um, but the bears would say we're going to test back down to towards that yellow line. Mm-hmm. Um, the bulls would see us, maybe we're just in the channel. So uh, maybe yeah, we're bottoming I, here. Obviously, I will draw the channel gonna, because yeah, yeah, that's what I can thinking. see that. Yeah, 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 that's what I was looking at. Yeah, yeah. So the bottom is 32 to wherever we are now. You can see we're kind of testing this and then the tops are closer to the 48 level and that we're just going to follow this channel for the next couple months maybe um you know there does seem to be a lot of support in the 30s um so we'll see what's your what's your take on that i mean i have much to say that's new on that um (laughs) all right so uh, i'm actually surprised a little bit uh, about so like two things but first of all let me say that yes this channel it's ascending wedge oh. is uh, is obviously an ascending wedge and ascending wedges are like one of the most scary things to me like the, one of the most bearish things to me because like <clears throat> 98% of the trading 99 even is done by bots these years and they are programmed always like uh, people uh, People love to copy paste uh, if they can. They always copy paste the others. So, uh, you know, it's like they then behave like a cluster, like a, um, like a cloud, like high, like a hive mind almost. Yeah, and they sure. react on the wedges pretty accurately. And when there is a long going ascending wedge, it's going to break down. Right. Uh, so. Uh, I don't think this channel is going to be followed for a couple of months. Uh, I think I was really thinking the last time when we did uh, when we did the, the podcast was here. I was really thinking that we were going to uh, ping back up, but uh, I'm not that sure because it's already going the, the, the ascending wedge is going on for like how many months? One, two, three, like at least three months, right? So that's a long time. And it's just a matter of time before it breaks down now. So, and yeah, as you said, however, uh, as for the breakdown, as you said, you mentioned lots of support on the 30s and I actually agree with you. And also the fact is that we have never really, let me bring up the uh, the greed and fear, for instance. Let me bring the greed and fear here. So we are back in extreme fears. So these levels are already really low. Like we mm-hmm. are already too afraid 
for us to really dramatically, dramatically drop because to 20k, that's an obvious level that, you know, people right. are looking at. 20k, it's it's a it's a staggering 50% down for Bitcoin and for altcoin, it will be 75% or so, even more. Right. So for that, we are really, really still like frozen in extreme fears. We have never seen, we have seen only one day of greed over the past months. That's way too little. So, right. you know, man, um, mm, yeah, it, once this, this ascending wedge breaks down, which it will pretty soon, I think, uh, then I agree with you that there is a lot of support below. I, I don't think the conditions are quite there to go dramatically down, but well, yeah, I can, of course, I cannot be sure. <laughs> yeah, this right. is just uh, my opinion. And another thing is that um, as we were dropping right here on the 17th on 18th of April, yeah, when you look at the, for instance, people are shorting, people are shorting like hell, like not, well, not like hell, but they are shorting. Right. That's an important thing. Also, the leverage, the over leveraging goes up because of the short. So now the over leveraging, uh, uh, it's like the, the new over leveraging that comes to the market is, is the shorts and that's extremely bullish as well. It will. It means that there is at some point going to be a short squeeze. But I think for that we still have to go. We still have to add the leverage, and we still have to go down. But yeah, bottom line. Uh, bottom line. I think this channel. We are gonna be out of this channel soon. But uh, I agree with your uh, assessment of the support. So uh, we I, haven't looked at the on-chain data for a while. I don't okay. have that chart in front. Um, but uh, we hit an all-time hash rate high. Wow. Okay. So, mm -hmm. uh, or almost, oh, sorry, almost very near, maybe the second highest hash rate ever in the history of Bitcoin. The last, the all time high is February 12th and April 24th, we hit the second highest all time high hash rate, um, which is interesting. The uh, miner wallets are holding strong. The miners are not selling. And the exchange reserves fell again, meaning more cold storage and less less on the exchanges. Okay, there you yeah, go. Well, there you this go. Is Bitcoin yeah, balance that's, is like on that's very similar. Your chart it looks like uh -huh. it's at two point four mil, right? Uh, uh, no. At the oh, moment, two point twenty five is... mil. Yeah, it's okay. it's not far, but yeah. Mine is mine is yeah. So oh, that's... there was a, this is the job you talk about. Well, um, yes, yes, but it's continuing. So I mean, look since. Uh, Wow. I mean, so yeah, it's mm -hmm. uh, a lot of coins going off exchanges. And we've agreed that this is not the only metric. It, it can be manipula manipulated, et cetera, but it's still something to watch. Um, yeah. It does show behavior. Um, it's just one of many metrics to look at. Yeah. It seems to me that the sell-offs are coming from whales um, there's something called a uh, wallet number three, which is the third largest active wallet. He's been selling and, okay. you know, people always, people always say, oh, that's manipulation. It, it's not necessarily even manipulation. He's just trading. Right. But, but it seems that wallet three is selling off when mm -hmm. price is going higher, you know? Um, okay. and is that whoever that entity is, you have to say, what are the motivations there? Is it to buy more? Um, but um, in any case, well, if he's a trader, then he's going to be back. He's going to be back at a slightly lower prices. So if he's right. a trader, you know, right, he, right. Yeah. Um, anyways. OK, that was for the Bitcoin. And now what do we go to next? Do we do S&P 500 or do we sure. go for yeah, S&P 500 is fine. SMP, yeah, okay, you start. <laughs> so yeah, another big sell-off last week. I think it was th with Thursday, Friday was a big sell-off. Quite. Um, those last two wicks were Thursday, Friday. The market opens up here in about five hours. Um, so yeah, the the Fed is going to be raising rates again soon. Okay. Uh huh. Um, it looks like so you might get a 0.5 uh, rate increase at the next meeting, and then another 0.25. So when they, they remain they remain fairly hawkish with their 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 latest um 
Well, because the inflation print was so high, right? So we had another monthly very high inflation. I think it was 8%. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. So um, the Fed, if everyone remembers, the Fed mandate is twofold. One is job creation, unemployment rate, and the other one is inflation, the consumer, we won't say consumer price index, the cost of goods. So the, the Fed kind of has to raise rates now. They can't say the inflation was transitory. Do you and know so when the, the market next doesn't is? like that? What's that? Do you know when the next meeting is? You mentioned. Uh, well, it would be um, May. Okay. Uh, Do you know end of no, May? No, I don't. I don't. I don't know. Let me look it up. Okay. Next Fed meeting. So they're every three months. The last um, one was the mid uh, March, I believe. It was a mid March. Yeah. Is it uh, three months then? So it would be June would be then. June. Yeah. Mid June ninth. Yeah, but of course okay. the market is is already anticipating that, right? Oh yeah. So everything gets pushed because it, it's 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 known known information gets priced immediately. So mm -hmm. um, the inflation Correct. print at the end of uh, at the end of uh, April, uh, end of March was like eight percent. So um, inflation is here to stay, and the Fed cannot tolerate that. The, yeah. So the markets hate hate it. They hate it. Um, and they sell off. Um, look at the, if you look at the 10 year treasury, that'll be interesting. I think I might have, did I send that to you? But uh, Fed 10 year. Fed 10 year. I might not have sent you that, but you can probably pull it up quick. Yeah. Um, not recently. Oh, so it just hit 3%. Oh, the okay. five year hit 3%. The 10 years at 2.86, I think. Yeah. So we talked in the last or two weeks ago, I think we were talking, no, uh, two, maybe a month ago, we were talking about how bond prices are inversely related to the, the yield yeah, yeah. on the 10-year and how ago. that mm -hmm. was creating a, the end of the, the bond bull market. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you can pull up, can you pull up, just type in 10-year treasury yield, USD, in on Google, and it'll, any screenshots, fine. Yeah, sure. It's at 2.9 percent. Then your treasury on CNBC, maybe or Yahoo Finance. Yeah, 2.82 percent. I got. Can you pull up a chart? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you go. So look at how fast it's climbing. Oh my right? gosh! Mm -hmm. So, you know, basically, if inflation rates oh are rising, wow. the U.S. government needs to offer higher and higher rates to interest people to buy US dollar treasuries, right? They mm -hmm. have to raise rates to get a proper bid, right? Yeah. So you're seeing that that's, so you're getting what we call the risk-free rate. In other words, there's zero risk to your capital. They'll give you 2.8% uh, over 10 years, 10 years, every year you get 2.8%. Um, so as that rises, um, bonds that were issued previously go down in value because this bond is more attractive than that bond because mm -hmm. this bond pays higher than that one did. So as the yield rises, the bond prices fall. And that's why we were saying the, the bull market and bonds that was running for about 40 years has ended. And then that's going to be significant for, you know, it, asset choices and things like that. So, yeah. so this rate should hit 4%, uh, maybe okay. as maybe this year. And, mm -hmm. um, so you're getting a 4% yield then on, on your, on your U S dollar holdings, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, better than nothing and better than it's been the last 10 years. So, uh, but that's the, well, that also means that people will be more inclined to, to go to cash for some time. Yes. And to go to the U S dollar, which we'll uh -huh. talk about in a bit on currencies, yeah. right? Because yeah, these is U S dollars. Um, so we'll get to that. Okay. Uh, yeah, as for the S&P 500, I want to add that currently the market is going to open even lower. If it opens right now, it would open at 4,231. Right. I can read that information from futures because there is S&P 500 futures and, right. you know, they just, they can predict that the market would open. So that's also why the crypto is right now dumping as well. Right. Right. And yet... So I yeah. guess for a comment on this, the, the big question is, does it break to new lows? So you can see just before March, it hit mm -hmm. almost 4,000, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
the big debate, if you watch legacy financial news, is was that the bottom February? What is it? February eighteenth, February yeah. 23rd. Is that the bottom, or are we going to go lower? I was very surprised that we actually, uh, uh, you know, didn't hold this thing point. I was pretty. I was. I really thought we would. We were going to hold. But the news, as you just as you said, the news actually caused this. Uh, the inflation uh, news triggered the Fed hawkishness, which uh -huh. triggers a negative sentiment. Assets are competing with each other, right? Which is more attractive in terms of the risk adjusted return? So that's what you're seeing. People are selling stocks and buying the US 10 year. Um, some of them are, right? Even though we dropped quite a lot, the Bitcoin is uh, holding relatively strong. This is my yeah. BLX uh, slash SMP, uh, yeah. SPX uh, a chart. And uh, so that's also uh, that's a supportive argument, which I just said that we are just too afraid, too, too bearish. We haven't, we haven't revisited greets. I think that we, uh, we are still too afraid to dramatically drop, actually. But... I think it's very bullish to see Bitcoin at least surviving. Oh through yeah, it's not moving that much down. Um, is yeah. this? I'm, you might say this is the first time Bitcoin has held some strength through a, something like a war, right? The U, the Ukraine war, mm -hmm. Russia Ukraine, mm -hmm. um, and some major market turmoil simultaneously. This is giving it some some a deeper resume, right? <laughs> a dip, yeah. a deeper historical um proof of, of 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 concept let's just say well i can speculate whether it's gonna go to the new lows i can come back to my previous call that i was making at the beginning of the year at the beginning of the year when we were well like in, in the mid mid january or so i used to have a circle here and that circle was corresponding to these tops here so just uh -huh. below four thousand yeah I yeah. used to have a circle just below yeah. 4,000, but yeah. then it didn't get hit and I deleted it. So uh, you might that, be right might be, that might be actually hit after all. Even if yeah. we go to the new lows, I really don't think we're going to go significantly lower at all. Not at all. I think right. that it's still lots of money uh, was lying on the sidelines that were looking for the opportunities to buy. Yeah. Uh, even though, as you said, that yes, people are now reconsidering uh, what to go into. <laughs> Also, this is the S&P 500 is a, is a uh, American, you know, uh, uh, top 500 companies and the US, you know, there, for instance, their arms industry is up 25 percent because they've been, you know, selling shitload of weapons to to Ukraine. So, yeah. And. Gold. Uh, well, yeah, gold, gold, oh, gold, gold, gold. There we go. <laughs> oh, my line, maybe my line, maybe my line is coming right after all. So, but sideways, ever right. since the last time we talked about it, just sideways. Notice that gold went down, even though stocks sold off. Mm -hmm. That's not good. I mean, it's only a two day. Look at that's Thursday, Friday, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it tends to respond inversely to stocks, but it's here you're seeing it sell off with stocks. Yep. That's not that's not a bullish signal. It's a very short term signal, I know, but um, not great. Yeah, my line still, I still believe in it. I still believe in it. If you hit my red line, I still believe that that's going to be, uh, uh, that would be, uh, uh, in my, this is not financial advice, but in my opinion, it, it could be amazing uh, by actually mm -hmm. the gold. We will see in time. This is a slow chart. Okay, so DXY, and this is going to get spicy. That's the US dollar. Yeah, look at that. So this, this was my, my weekly yeah this was my weekly uh line it closed above that and it closed above that but still around mm -hmm. but right now this is actually first day yeah, yeah yeah today it's open for the first day it's above that but let's see let's see if if i'm right here if my calls are right i have these lines here for a long time i know that i had them even on, my, on our first uh, on our first podcast, so we were around here or so, and we didn't know whether even the first line is gonna be hit. And then, you know, this is both a monthly line and this is a weekly line, and now both got hit. So yeah, let's see if I'm right. If my call is correct, then we are going to see reversal literally soon, like in the upcoming weeks, like maybe mm -hmm. in the two weeks from now. 
my next call is this uh, bot blue line so <laughs> i know right. it sounds funny today it sounds it doesn't feel like it should happen uh the evidence it's not like actually here but that's the thing like it never feels like it it, it never it you know the uh, very often the right calls actually feel like really funny ones yeah ethereum yeah i think we should just have a look at ethereum we should make it yeah, Ethereum finally had the uh, uh, news related to merge and surprise, surprise. Did you hear? Did you hear, Curtis? Well, it was delayed again, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> surprise, surprise. I wasn't surprised, by the way. But uh, but it's not a disaster because delayed just for a couple of months. It's I don't think it's going well, it's to damage. It's been years. It's been it's been four years now. Yeah, we, we, uh, people <laughs> waited for four years so they can wait more. Like, yeah, like two more months or, or so, three more months. I guess you whatever. could look at it that way. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's eventually it's going to come out eventually. That news and that merge release, <clears throat> most of all, will affect the Ethereum on a Bitcoin chart, which is not, no, it's not a surprise. It's declining now after the news. Right. But uh, there are some milestones to, to overtake. And the next milestone is definitely this. This big, so 0 0.1, 0 0.11, and I think all of that is going to be uh, related to the merge release. Sure. Well, we can talk about uh, just Tesla. Quick, quick follow up. So, Tesla came out with their earnings. Okay. I sent you an article. Yeah, I'm going to show that, but I will also prepare the chart in case you need it. So there we go. So Tesla came out with its, its first quarter earnings uh, and they were amazing. Um, so if you scroll, so it looked, um, so basically they're, they're able to charge more for their cars now. So they're making more oh per gosh. car, plus <laughs> they've got the volume sales, right? So what was it? Um, so they beat expectations. I think it was something like seven times higher than last year. So year on year, um if you scroll down it might have some numbers there i can't i can't scroll down um i think i saw 86 percent. that's too far you can't go that fast i can't read that oh sorry uh no, you go to just go down slowly and you might see it from the top up and then 87 percent yeah okay I so got it. revenue up 87 i mean that's amazing right um so yeah, so they went up like pre-market, they went up 11%. By the end of the day, they were up about 5%, which is still quite good, 6%. Um, so first they told them they wouldn't be able to mass produce cars. Mm -hmm. Then when they did that, they said, well, you, you're not going to be able to do it profitably. And then they did it profitably. And they said, yeah, but you're not going to be able to do both at the same time. And now they're doing both at the same time. They're building tons of cars. They're selling tons of cars. And their profit margins are up. So don't bet against Elon. Um, and not only that, I mean, the stock's above $1,000, even though it's a bear market for the rest of the S&P. So Tesla's one of the only companies doing well in this market. And even the last year, they've been the only sort of outlier. I'll have There's a look still... at the chart again. Okay, this is the yeah, chart. Yeah, they're almost, almost at all-time highs, right? So they went up significantly since the mid-March, just like you yeah. were saying. I mean, scroll this back a, a bit. It was a 53%. Yeah, go okay. back, look at a two-year chart or something like that. I will look at weekly candles. That's going to show. Yeah. So, I mean, oh, look, I we're almost at all-time highs. 52 to very moment where we are, it's 21x, yes. To the all-time high, it's 26, 26x. 26 yeah. So, um, one of the greatest moves in investment history. Like, other than crypto, you're not really ever seeing that. Maybe Amazon did that. Um, even Apple never did that in, in a yep. short period of time. One of the most amazing um, stories ever. Yeah, um, agreed. So, so we'll keep moving because I've got some other stuff to cover, but there's one more. He talks about robo taxis. Okay, there we go. And um, that basically there's going to be no steering wheel and no brakes. I mean, some <laughs> of the stuff he says for effect, but uh, I believe him. Um, you know, it's a few years ago. This is unbelievable. He's saying, uh, Two years from now, 2024, no wheels, no steering wheels, no brakes. So they'll be super oh light, gosh. right? Okay. It makes the car super, right? Already there's no um, 
combustion engine, right? Which makes it like, you wonder why Teslas are so fast, right? Because they don't have any, any weight to them. And if you take out the steering wheel, it's just basically a floating, I don't know what it is. <laughs> it's a floating machine. It's a floating iPad. Okay. You know, but, um, this is huge. And then the next one is robots as well. They're going to come out with some robots. Oh so. my gosh. Yeah. I, I watched the presentation when he disclosed that there was a, a, a <laughs> there was a model, there was a guy in a dressed as a robot doing some dancing. dancing. Yeah. And then Elon came to the stage and, you know, talked about that this thing is, you know, going to go to the households and that he wants to start the mass production of that within like two years or, and yeah, he said right. that last year. So the next year, and that the right. prototype should be around any moment. Right. Oh right. my gosh. Like that is a revolution if I've ever seen one because, I, because the GDP is being limited by the lack of the workforce because there is still just a lack of the workforce. Yeah. And that would actually cause the surplus of the workforce. And that would actually mean that the first time the humans actually could have, you know, the you know, all the basic jobs, actually, like we could literally be fed by the uh, by the air. Of course, that creates the problems of its own. There is a philosophical discussion behind it. We can talk about it in the next podcast sure. about AI. Sure. OK, yeah. so uh, yeah, go on. Yeah, just go staying on. to the investment thesis rather than the sort of social cultural okay. implications. But mm -hmm. um, the robo taxi autonomous driving business is worth at least i would say it's worth 500 dollars a share like i think the stock price goes up at least 50 percent, maybe 100 percent on that mm -hmm. and then the oh. robot he said the robots are going to be potentially bigger revenue than the cars i mean again it's such a it's such a big idea it's very hard to absorb it potential my it's but, um, humanity i i wouldn't bet against elon <laughs> yeah uh yeah for me he's also quite hard to read I, I can't figure out one thing, whether he is, uh, whether he really is who he, who he, who we think we, we, he is, but that's a good thing that I can't figure it out because <laughs> about most of these figures, you just know that they are, they are playing backstage. Everything right. they say is, is rather cynical because this world we live in today is extremely cynical. Media sure. is extremely cynical. Politics is completely cynical. You know, sure. all the pretendants that we want to save the lives and, you know, the moment, you know, they say that they do everything they can to create more suffering because that's just the way to progress for for their groups or whatever. So I can't I can't I'm not sure whether Elon is cynical or not. And that's a good thing. Yeah, I don't think he is, is. but but maybe that's not proven yet. But I, I think he's legit. Mm -hmm. I think he's legitimate. OK. All right, so we, uh, yeah, why don't we go to my sort of um, presentation, um, if you want, for that. Um... So Curtis prepared a report for you. Yeah, so it's, um, we had some questions about the US dollar and currencies. Um, and the ruble. And the ruble and USD. And so um, for the listeners, I thought we'd first maybe talk about some of the fundamentals and then the discussions make more sense. Um, mm -hmm. what affects the value of a currency generally. I think this relates to crypto, right? Because, well, when you say crypto, let's say Bitcoin or um, either Bitcoin or another cryptocurrency becoming um, a substitute for fiat currencies. To, to, to have this discussion, you really need to understand what you're talking about. And you first have to understand fiat currencies. And then you can maybe talk about why, for example, the US dollar might fail um, mm -hmm. and and unless it fails, you, you probably don't see a substitute. So, um, so anyways, um, maybe we've got about 15, 20 minutes here. Um, so you can see the chart, um, what affects the value of a currency. So I just listed uh, five sort of bullet points of to think about. Um, we're talking about currency value in relation to other currencies. So it's a relative thing, right? So we're talking mm -hmm. about the yen versus the US dollar or the ruble versus yeah. the US dollar. Mm -hmm. the Canadian dollar versus the, the, the Australian dollar, etc. But I think people need to get a grasp of this before they can speak intelligently about um, some of the other issues. So just quickly, um, what affects the value of a currency? Um, number one is the current account deficit. So what we call the balance of trade. Um, 
uh, on the left there, if you can highlight that. Um, yeah. So basically, um, selling more goods abroad, more exports than what you import. Okay, this causes your currency to strengthen. Okay, so for example, Japan produces more goods for sale, things like cars and heavy industry and machinery, mm -hmm. than it does import things like food and oil. So Japan has a trade surplus or a current account surplus. That's why the yen has upward pressure of strength towards it. That's one of the factors. Okay, so when you sell the goods, if Japan sells a car, what happens? The buyer, the American buyer, will have to repatriate dollars from US dollars into yen. When, when Toyota sells the car and brings the money back to Japan, they buy yen and they sell whatever they bought the currency in, the currency was bought in. So in that case, you have a, a net purchase of Japanese yen, mm -hmm. okay? And vice versa, if you have a country that is selling or is buying more from abroad than it actually produces, you have a negative pressure on its the, the value of its okay. currency, mm -hmm. okay, because of the reverse. So that's number one. Number two, uh, so basically number one is if you're producing more than you're, you're, you're bringing in, you're going to have a stronger currency, and this is uh -huh. something you want to have. Number two is government stability and reputation, your brand, your overall economic policies. So it's really important that your company has a good reputation. Maybe you can highlight number two so people can yep. follow. Um, um, the brand of your country, the future prospects of your country, is your country stable politically? Or are you going to have a, a coup? Are you going to get overthrown by communists in mm -hmm. the next six months? Um, will you pay your bonds? So if, oh, someone's, going, you're right, mm -hmm. if someone's going to buy Canadian bonds, they're going to buy in Canadian dollars. They have to trust that the Canadian government is not going to have a coup and they're not going to default and they're going to pay oh, you back yep. in 10 yep. years, right? <laughs> um, this is something the U.S. dollar has, right? People are pretty much sure the U.S. dollar, the U.S. government is going to be liquid and pay back their bonds. Whereas if you look at countries like Argentina, they've defaulted several times. They've broken oh, those promises, mm -hmm. right? So the country needs to be pro-business, pro-growth, attract investment, attract wealthy citizens, there's no political unrest, and their reputation is good, okay? Um, the third one is to do with, that, that also gives you a stronger currency, is your fiscal policy, your interest rates, your money printing, and inflation, yeah. okay? So the differentials in the interest rate, um, right now you're seeing the US dollar rise and the DXY rise, okay, why is that? It's because interest rates are rising in the US, the U.S. government is offering higher percent, 2.9% currently, for you to hold U.S. dollars. That's how they raise money, is they issue U.S. debt at a rate of currently 2.9%. Um, this is uh, people buying and holding U.S. dollars. As the demand goes up, the price goes up, assuming supply stays the same. Okay, so it's basic economics. Um, Inflation, on the other hand, is a bad thing. So if you have inflation in a country, it means the purchasing power of those dollars are falling, okay? Mm -hmm. um, a really important, do you see where I, it says money printing is inflation? Can you highlight yeah, that? There you go. So for your listeners, this is a really critical understanding of what inflation is. People mm -hmm. tend to say or make the mistake that they think inflation is pr prices rising. That is... is um, that is the effect and not the cause. Okay. When you say inflation is prices rising, it's not uh, necessarily the case. Okay, Actually, I... printing money, increasing the number of dollars is the inflation. Prices rise because those increased number of dollars will bid up rare assets. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's kind of the same thing when you look at it generally, but there's an important difference there that actually when you increase the money supply, that is the definition of inflation. For example, some prices will fall even if you're in printing more money. Because there is a generally uh, differentiated the inflation and purchasing power of money. It, yeah, people can look deeper on that. But basically, so in the US, you have two things. The US dollar is strengthening even though the US uh, government is printing lots of money, right? They did the, the COVID stimu stimulus checks and all of that. So, so these are, in a way, they're fighting each other. But um, 
anyways, that's fiscal policy is important. Interest rates are important. Inflation differentials are important. Uh, public debt. So again, you want to have a stable, large government that you trust. Okay. Uh, number four is the network effect or liquidity. So very similar to cryptocurrencies, the uh, you know the more crypto on more exchanges means there's more liquidity and the price tends to rise. It's the same with currencies. The more countries that use or trade in that currency, and the more of a network effect it has, the more powerful that currency is. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. so we'll talk a little bit later, but the U.S. dollar is about 90% of global forex trade, right? Um, okay. But network effect, liquidity, how badly do people want to hold that currency? Okay, mm -hmm. number five, and this is important, um, uh, governments, even though all of these things are true, the one to four, governments will still manipulate global exchange rates. They will literally call each other the Japanese mm -hmm. government will call the U.S. government and say, the U.S. dollar is too strong, please weaken it. And they'll literally make phone calls to each other. And so there's a lot of games played where they will time their news feeds and time their money printing because mm -hmm. none of these countries want the rates to be too far out of whack because it, it, it disrupts business, because it affects yeah. sales and, and, and exports. So even though all of these things are true, there's a bit of a uh, collusion not a bit, there's a massive collusion among G7 and G20 countries to make sure things don't get out of whack too much because it's bad for business. It's dis Let's just say it's disruptive to business. And so, for example, I think if the, if the yen gets much weaker, um, there'll be some way, some market manipulation so that mm -hmm. they can rebalance it against the US dollar uh, because it starts to disrupt the import export, the trade balance. Why is the US dollar the global reserve currency? Okay, um, that's a long conversation. Uh, Post-World War II, right? The Bretton Woods Agreement, uh, 1944, towards the end of the... Yeah, there's a link here on Investopedia. Um, you can look it up. But the 1944 Bretton Woods Agreement allowed other countries to back their currencies with dollars rather than gold. So the US dollar became a gold equivalent. And then in 1970, uh, President Nixon said, actually, we're not giving you gold for our dollars. So he broke his promise and said the U.S. dollar is basically uh, the backbone of the world economy, and that has continued for the last 80 years, 70 years. Mm -hmm. um, I believe the Saudis have a deal also to have oil be purchased in U.S. dollar mm -hmm. only. Okay, that was a deal. I believe the U.S. government made a deal, said, look, Saudi... Saudi princes will protect you from getting overthrown in exchange. We want you to peg, not peg, but to, to require oil purchases to be made in the US dollar only. So yeah, it's geopolitics. There's a lot of negotiating. Um, you can see, if you go back to my article mm -hmm. or my, my write-up um, on the right, 60% uh, at the top, 60% of all known central bank for foreign exchanges are in US dollars. So all of the currencies owned by all of the countries in the world, all of that, 60% of it is US dollars, only 20% is Euro. Wow. And then the remaining 20% is, is Canadian dollar, yen, and a long tail of other small currencies. But mm -hmm. so the US dollar still is the dominant force. It's 90% of Forex trade. If you go to the third paragraph, you can see 90%. Yeah. It's got liquidity. It's got network effect. It's got ownership. It's got the mm -hmm. oil trade. It's still definitely the, the dominant currency. Um, and it's hard to see that changing, although we, you know, people keep talking about it and things do happen that are surprises. 40% um, of the world's debt is issued in dollars, if you can see that. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah. if you highlight that, that's important. So what that means is if I have a, a contract and mm -hmm. I promised U.S. dollars to someone, I have to pay that debt back in U.S. dollars. I have to buy back U.S. dollars to pay it back. Yeah. So the, the legal contracts are denominated in U.S. dollars. You can't change that. You can't say, oh, I'll pay in Canadian dollars. No, you're breaking the contract. You must pay it back in U.S. dollars. So that, that's 40% of global contracts or debt 
in the entire world is denominated in U.S. dollars. People forget this. Wow. You can't say I'm I'm not paying you back in U.S. dollars. You have to go buy the U.S. dollars every month and pay it back. Buy U.S. dollars, pay it back. So you, mm-hmm. you can't you can't do a switcheroo and say I'm going to pay you in ruble this year. You're not allowed to. So all of these things underpin a strong U.S. dollar looking forward. Um, there's lots of reasons why this could break. Right. I would like to talk about rubles. Sure. Let's talk about the ruble. So uh, surprise, surprise. For those of you who didn't know, ruble is now pegged to the gold. But yeah. I think it's one of the very few currencies, if not the only one, one of the, the only major currency, fiat currency, that is pegged to this uh, commodity. But as we just uh, discussed with Curtis prior to the start of the podcast, this promise might not, nobody knows how long this promise will last. That's the bottom right. line. Right. As long as it lasts, however, I think that uh, Ruble, and this is just one of my reasoning why Ruble, this is the uh, US dollar slash Ruble chart. So, uh, I think ruble is going to be strengthening over the next years dramatically. I think it's very hard to say based on the chart how how uh, how much it will strengthen. Right. Uh, I think it will. But even if I go uh, over the point that uh, Curtis has been uh, bringing up, a very you know brilliant, uh, great point, uh, great report by the way. So. Uh, uh, current account deficit, balance of trade, so selling more goods uh, than you import. Well, Russia has all just the resources, right? It has yes. like unbelievable portion of the world's resources and more are being found. So yes. they will always be more ex- exporters than importers. Government stability and reputation and brand. Well, uh, if this, if the government survives this, uh, this crisis, this unprecedented amount of sanctions that have never really been in the history imposed uh, in such a scale uh, on one country, if if the government survives this, then there is like that's going to be the greatest test of the government in a, in a history because, like then, like it will then survive anything. Yeah. Uh, fiscal policy, interest rate, money printing, inflation, because of the pegging of the, to the, to the gold, the money printing is going to be issue everywhere, but not in Russia, not in the ruble, in my opinion, in my humble opinion. And for the interest rates, I'm not sure what, what interest rates are today in, uh, in, uh, in Russia, but I believe it's double digit. I believe it's, it's like 15% or so. It's, it's quite a lot. Uh, Network effect liquidity, uh, large wealthy population that hold a currency. I think that also uh, is another point. Uh, I think that will also uh, work for the, for the ruble. So uh, yeah, I, I, as I we, we discussed it briefly with uh, with Curtis prior to the start of the uh, of the podcast, and we both agreed that that we both believe that the fiat currencies overall are at its last. We both believe, and I believe, that the fiat currencies have approximately five more years to live. And people might not realize it because five years is not that that long. But when you look at the uh, WM2, the money printing, for instance, you can see that this is just not uns- not sustainable and it's not going to get down. It's only going to go up, even even accelerate more. Who knows? So I believe it's it's approximately five years. And I'm not sure uh, what's going to come after. Uh, we can hope, but uh, for one, but uh, I'm not sure about it. But I think that Ruble is going to be one of the last fiat standing. That's my opinion. Yeah, my comments would be, I agree. Uh, so it does have a trade surplus and mm-hmm. with commodity, they, do, they are commodity rich. So that's, that's mm-hmm. bullish for the currency. If you look at the government stability, that's a negative overall. I think they've Currently. become a pariah. And Currently, could they yes. be choked to death? Yeah, I think the world economy could choke Russia to death if they wanted to. So it's just, a, it doesn't mean it's going to happen, but it's definitely mm-hmm. a risk. Um, uh, Russians themselves are going to be leaving the ruble perhaps 
just because of the risk of that, right? So rich Russians maybe currently, yeah, uh, yeah. Do if I'm a if I'm a billionaire and I live in Moscow, do I want to hold U.S. dollars or ruble? Um, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to say, right? It's hard. It depends to say. on what kind of a patriot would be. Would yeah, be? but only the patriot. Are, yeah, the patriot. Um, so a lot of them go for the U.S. dollar or at the or moment. Right, but yeah, I suspect. And then time frame. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Well, we could go on and talk about what would might replace um, fiat, uh, but that's that's a very speculative, and that might be another very video. Very speculative, yeah, um, yeah. Nobody knows um, today, right? And maybe even nobody can know because I think some things have to be unexpected to the very last moment. If people expect it, then it's not going to happen. But uh, the world will need uh, some sort of currency, global currency, to replace. Fiat. The future economy. Uh, Bitcoin would be the obvious front runner of that, or cryptos generally, I guess. Crypto um, generally, definitely. The, the the idea is that Bitcoin does not have a nation, and therefore it's neutral, right? It's not manipulable by by governments in that sense, right? And it is something that um, all world governments might accept, as long as it's uh, uh, verified. Do not trust, right? And, it's um, true. Yeah. Oh, oh, and. Yeah. Um, then you know and then is it is it is it secure is it trusted is it you know and um we, we wait and see on that but um i don't see. see other alternatives the lighting network people are kind of bullied into using lighting network because of the high fees and speed and the lighting network is heavily centralized there are entities like joe joe mallers that uh, uh who is a, he's a billionaire who owns like like 18 or 1900 the last time i looked it was like 1800 lighting notes and right. also the lighting is also a very good spy tool it's like uh, there is lots of stuff going on behind the stage and of course if you were if if i was the the the, the agencies you have to step into the if into their shoes if i was uh, some federal agencies or some shadow government or whatever entity that rules the world you know, I would at first, I would think that this is just some kind of a pawn scene is going to die, you know, but here, when this happened in 2013, 2014, I would realize that, oh my shit, this is not going to die. Oh my God, and more people are coming into this. This is actually a threat. And what I would then do, I would devise a plan how to infiltrate the the ecosystem, how to create some kind of a mechanism to, to so that so I can have a control over that. That's what I would do if I was a if I was a shadow government or a uh, some agency. Yeah, they're usually not that smart, but I guess that could happen. Yeah. I would not underestimate them, though. I wouldn't overestimate them either. But <laughs> the, and um, also, the mining is getting slightly more centralized, don't you think? Because too much mining is being moved to the U.S. Right. Right. Don't you? Well, think that? yeah, but when it was in China, that yeah. So people who don't like Bitcoin are always saying what they don't like about it. Right. <laughs> okay. So when it was it was in China too much and oh that's the threat. Now it's not in China. Oh that's bad also, right? So and then um I guess I come from more of a Michael Saylor point of view that governments will get their fingers on Bitcoin. It's uh, it's unavoidable, but they like the only thing worse than Bitcoin is every other cryptocurrency, <laughs> right? The only thing worse than capitalism is every other form of government. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's a lot of valid criticisms of Bitcoin. They tend to keep failing, I would say, though, because we again we used to we were told it was because China was centralized. Then they leave China. Then it's because it's too much in the U.S. Maybe both are true. Like maybe, maybe, but it just seems like they keep moving the goalposts, right? the The big thing will be the spot Bitcoin ETF. And then mm -hmm. it's going to be a major country adopting, like forget El Salvador, it's going to be Mexico adopting or Brazil or something. And that's going to take things off to the next level. Um, will it be manipulated by the government? Yes. Will it be taxed? Yes. Will there be spying? Yes. I think all of those things will happen irrespective of what we use, whether it's any other currency. Um, but the thing is, the, the Bitcoin network, you cannot inflate it. So some of the government power will fall, even if they're using it for spying, even if they're using it for the wrong, it'll still be better than our system now. It'll still be an improvement. It, it may not be a libertarian dream, but it, it might be a, an improvement.
just okay. because of the fixed supply. Anyways, you said name me a currency, so I will name you now one currency. But That's better than Bitcoin. <laughs> the problem is that all of the currencies that are uh, better than Bitcoin are still in development. Like right. uh, there is very few. Maybe there is Zilliqa. Uh, Zilliqa is one of those layer ones that is uh, running and or maybe I don't know that much about Phantom as well, but I know the thing Zilliqa that I know that. about Phantom and I've heard yeah. about it, uh, it doesn't seem that centralized to me either. But uh -huh. I want to talk to you a little bit about Radix uh, at okay. last or at the end of our podcast. Yeah. So uh, if you, you know, a name here, cryptocurrency, Radix is one of these that really just it's a jaw dropping project. It's a fifth generation crypto. There are quite few uh, fifth generation cryptocurrencies. Uh, there we go. Uh, this is just uh, one of the uh, reports that I found for Radix that summarizes like tech, team, uh, performance, roadmap, Radix engine servers. That's the components of their uh, of their project. This is the leadership. This is Dan Hughes. He's one of the smartest guys in crypto overall. Piers Ridiar, he's a CEO. Uh, Russell Harvey, I don't know much about him. I've never seen him talk, to be honest. But uh, yeah, Dan and, and Piers, they, they do very often their uh, technical AMAs or any other events. There's a little bit of the problem that uh, they communicate with the, uh, yeah, the the way they pass the information seem to be a little too complicated, in my opinion, a little too intellectual. It also perhaps closes the door to the more speculation, like it's like more of the geeks that are in the project. If you follow me, you know, more mm -hmm. of the just uh, technical people like who can see this project for what it is. Right. Important That's thing. That's a problem. Coming. That's a problem. But yeah. That's quite a problem. Yes. But it's like when you ask Dan a question, he always wants to tell you like, uh, like the definitely correct answer. So then he, yeah. instead of saying yes or no, he goes for five minutes and Pierce even more so or 10 minutes. Big problem. So, <laughs> so that's, uh, that's a little bit of the, yeah, uh, like, uh, they, they really should simplify the communication, but that's just a little bit of the criticism as for the project itself, it's going to still be years before it's finished, but it's, it's performance already. It's like jaw dropping. I'm not sure if you've heard about I it. I hadn't really heard. No, I hadn't heard of Radix. So, okay, there is like, a, there we have a, a, a there, okay, we have a Bitcoin and Ethereum, then we have a, like third generation cryptocurrencies like Cardano, Tezos, Algorand or Avalanche or stuff, Polkadot, three generation that talk about Cardano has a white paper, why Hydra could scale Cardano or should scale to uh, even hundreds of thousands of transactions a second. But it's right. just a white paper. It's still just like this is this can be this might be this will be. But there is not a there is a very few projects who's actually done that. Yeah. Yeah. And there is an audition test that the Radix has done. They actually uh, were running uh, 1.4 million transactions a second. So mm -hmm. you this is a completely new like uh, dimension like there is stuff here that the bitcoin can never ever this is like when you're comparing a horse to a cars like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you can never really what kind of even if you you know the horse can never be the car right but this is just the speed of course there is a lot of other aspects like buildability security uh a lot of other stuff that uh, layer one needs you know for it okay. to be a really good layer one and also one of the this is what this was a funny test. Yeah, I dug up this for you from Reddit as well, because this is from the Dan Hughes himself. Three months ago, he was having fun. He was streaming 4K video through the blockchain just to show okay. how how fast it is. And this is okay. also demonstrating something that the other layer ones will probably never be able to do. And this is still just that uh, this project is years from completion still. It's going to be 2024 likely when Radix, but right. it's going to be most likely one of the biggest projects in the whole world, actually. Uh, as for the valuation of the token today, the valuation is not doing much 
because there was also a lot of token unlocked last year. Then there was some huge pump. I don't even know why this pump happened, to be honest. I really don't know why. But it, the price came back to the very same levels that it moved from. So <laughs> it's literally just going sideways still. Uh huh. Honestly, I, I just get I'm exhausted by how many projects there are. I know there's mm -hmm. good projects out there. I I know that I know that the world will be surprised by projects other than Bitcoin, and that there will be success stories. I just don't know which ones. Like you said that okay, so the only thing worse than Bitcoin is every other cryptocurrency or something <laughs> like that. So well. <laughs> What so, I'm saying is, if you if you're going to criticize Bitcoin and then not go and criticize Ethereum, it's you're, you're oh, a fraud, I criticize right? Ethereum every yeah. day. Not you, not you. I mean, generally, <laughs> okay. right? Like, if you're going to people talking about Bitcoin centralization and they're uh -huh. they're pushing Ethereum, obviously that's silly, right? It's ridiculous. But but I, as a sim very simple example of what I was saying, um, no, what I'm saying. Uh, look, we could talk for hours about this, but. Um, whoever is the market leader is going to get the most criticism. But if you look at ownership, there's so many metrics that say Bitcoin is going to be the winner, right? There's just so many metrics. When you say winner, so what exactly do you mean winner? I think the game if theory suggests that Bitcoin will be the most adopted cryptocurrency in the world. It will be a digital okay. asset. It may not, it will not be a buy your coffee uh, type coin. It's not going for that, but it will be owned by the largest number of people. Um, it will be a digital asset similar to like a digital gold. You, it will be taxed heavily. Um, it will be a way to store value over long periods of time. So this is the Michael Saylor argument. I, I agree quite closely with it. Governments are not going to let these currencies be untouched. They will be monitored. They will be taxed. Um, other coins will surface. That's fine. But um, in terms of network effect and game theory, I think Bitcoin is going to be the winner. It's not going to be categorized as a security. We'll talk about the Howey test later on. Mm -hmm. um, it will Someone be one of the tests. only coins that is not uh, sort of, let's say, attacked by the SEC. Um, it's got first mover advantage. It's got network effect advantage. And very soon the game, like as soon as an ETF in the US is approved, you're going to see massive institutional investment. And I think that's the end of the game. Um, just because you're going to have it in pension funds, you're going to have it. It's already on the the um, S and P, right? It's already the miners or publicly traded companies. So the game theory suggests that Bitcoin is going to be the winner, even if the technology is not the best. The okay. best technology does not win. It's and, it, it, that, that's just not how it works. Um, and if Bitcoin loses the ranking in the capitalization ladder, would it invalidate your call? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, okay. That's so you could perhaps see. So if you look at the numbers here, Ethereum is the only one that really has a chance. At the right? moment. At the at moment. The moment. Mm -hmm. um, definitely, you could see both Ethereum and Bitcoin be quote unquote winners. And you could also see another 20 coins be winners, or maybe uh -huh. another 100 coins be winners, mm -hmm. maybe another thousand, but they'll be long tail winners and they'll be very specific. So they might be gaming. Technologies, for example, the thing is that it tends to be that all of these long tail people eventually get wiped out because the larger players will innovate technologically to take that as well. It tends to be that the larger players win, right? Okay, we have to wrap this up. Unfortunately, we're going on for <laughs> over sure, an hour. Sure. I so it's not so, just a market cap issue is what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm sure we could continue for the next half an hour in this discussion. We have still lots of things to say, but the good thing is that two weeks uh, from now, there is another day, another podcast. I'm going to, I'm <laughs> looking forward to it. Uh, I will let Curtis to choose the main uh, topic for the next podcast. I think there are two suggestions so far. One is how we test right. and the second is the AI. AI, okay. What, it's okay, right. so what would you like to choose? For the next podcast um let's do the how we test because okay so how we test it is so it yeah we'll talk about that definitely will and with ha having said that have a nice few weeks bye bye